I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. In today's episode, the police investigate after a young woman goes missing. There's no reason why she would suddenly disappear. So very, very quickly, it was clear to us, the police, that something really serious had happened. And a shock to discover her whereabouts are the key to unlocking a nearly decade-old crime. I got that knock on the door, and I said to him, oh, my God, I said, it's my daughter, isn't it? It all happened by that stage. They'd arrested this man, and another drama was unfolding away from our eyes. This is Judge Rinder's crime story. In 2011, a young woman went missing after a night out with friends in Swindon Town Centre. As the police investigated her disappearance, little would they know that their findings would reignite one of Wiltshire Police's cold cases and leave the nation stunned at what they would discover. The town of Swindon in Wiltshire lies midway between Bristol to the west and Reading to the east, and in 1982, it's where Karen Edwards gave birth to daughter Becky. I remember the day Becky was born. Um, it was a beautiful day. Um, when she was born and given to me, I just cried. Sorry. And she sort of completed my little family. Joining older brother Stephen, Becky was the apple of her mother's eye. She was a beautiful little girl, and as she grew up, she really was a little, a little princess. She started school, and she loved reading. She liked to be top of the class. She was a star pupil. Becky was only six when her parents separated, but despite this, she continued to excel. It wasn't until she reached senior school that things started to go wrong. She was bullied at school. I can remember having a phone call at work one day and some girls in the school had made her take her cardigan off um, and they stood in, put it in some dog's mess and stood in it and made her put it back on again. And it really did frighten her. So I marched into the school. I said, I'm not taking this bullying anymore. I'm not having it. I'm taking it out of the school as from today and I move in her schools. And she moved to the other school. And the bullying just continued. This relentless bullying led Becky to self-harm. And at the age of 13, she attempted suicide. Despite the support of a psychologist and lengthy period of school, Becky's situation continued to deteriorate. I'd noticed for a while that my aerosol cans had gone missing. I confronted her and said, are you aerosol sniffing? And she said, nothing. Shrugged her shoulders. That's what Becky did when she didn't want to answer you. Following this confrontation, Becky ran away from home, something that sadly was to become a regular occurrence. She started becoming very crafty. In the beginning, we used to find her, and then she started the stage we, we wouldn't we wouldn't find her. It was like she turned again from this beautiful little girl into a little demon. And things continue to get worse. Karen found out that Becky had started using harder drugs. She admitted that yes, she'd started on heroin. I, I just didn't know what to say to her. I really didn't know what to say apart from this has got to stop. And I really truly believe that she could just stop it like that. But you can't just stop heroin like that. Drug use only added to Becky's problems. After being arrested for burglary and skipping bail, she was in trouble with the authorities. I'd had a phone call from Becky. <laughs> and she was in prison. They'd arrested her because she'd been on the run and I was horrified. I, I just couldn't believe it. And I went to see her in prison. Prison. I thought, my God, what 
what's going on now. It was just a constant stream of events. You know, no matter how hard you tried, the demon drug was greater than anything else. Becky spent three weeks in prison before she appeared in court. The judge found her 100, I think it was 125 pounds, and she was given probation, which meant that she had to get her drug habit under control and she had to see somebody. Hoping that it was the wake-up call Becky needed, Karen was there to take her home. I said, oh, put my arm around her, and I said, do you want to go home now? And I soak in the tub. And then she said, I want to go and see my boyfriend. Oh. I said, I can't believe this, Becky. I went, OK, I'll take you there. You can pop in and see him, and then we're going home. Is that a deal? OK. So she told me where to go and I drove and parked outside. She got out of the car and she walked down. I sat and I watched. I kept looking at my watch. Then she came out and she said, Mum, can I just stop for another half an hour? I said, I'd rather you come home, Becky. And she said, oh, just half an hour, Mum. Just half an hour. I thought, here we go again. If I say no, she's going to run away anyway. Desperate to have Becky back home, Karen waited patiently in the car until she saw her appear once again. And she said, Mum, I want to stop a bit longer. I said to her, Becky, I know what you're doing in there. You're back on the drugs again, aren't you? I know what you're doing. And she said, I love you so much, Mum. I can't keep putting you through all this. And I'll come back when I've sorted myself out. And she walked away from me. I could see her, just the back of her walking away. It was every parent's worst nightmare. And as days turned to weeks, Becky failed to return home. The Christmas of 2002, I really was expecting Becky to come back. She just didn't turn up. And the conversation all that day was about Becky, wondered if she'd knock on the door. And then I kept thinking, well, she did tell me she wouldn't come back till she was clean. So Christmas went by and I thought, well, perhaps she might come tomorrow, you know, and you just keep on. And then, well, she's not coming back. Eight months after she last saw Becky, Karen decided it was now time to go to the police. I was getting worried. You know, this was probably the longest time she'd ever been gone. We stood in the queue and there was a woman on the desk. And I said to her, look, you know, my daughter's gone missing again. And this is her photograph. Her name's Becky. She said, oh, she said, no, nobody's been reported. No, no trouble reported here. So I thought, well, she must be OK. And I came out and I said to Charlie, they didn't really take that very seriously, did they? And he said, well, Karen, She's a runaway, you know, she's a drug addict that they're not going to be worried about her because of that. During this time, there were some glimmers of hope for Karen. And then I started getting reports from people to say that Becky had been seen in Bristol and she was running a nightclub with her boyfriend. So these little drippets of information were actually quite comforting because I thought, even though I was angry with her, at least she was still out there. At least she was, she was somewhere. Karen was used to Becky's disappearances, but never before had she been gone for so long. Karen was desperate to see her daughter once again, but in 2011, reports of a missing girl in Swindon 
would soon lead her to the truth behind Becky's disappearance. After the break, the race is on to find another missing girl, Sean O'Callaghan. We didn't know where Sean was. We needed to find her, hopefully alive. But do the police know more than they're letting on? I knew straight away that this was was a big deal because they simply wouldn't have put a detective of this, this rank in charge of just a basic missing persons inquiry. Swindon Town Centre, Friday the 18th of March, 2011. 22-year-old Sean O'Callaghan was enjoying an evening out at a local nightclub with some friends. Sean, um, at that time, was living with her boyfriend, Kevin, um, and was going on a girly night out with some friends from his uh, football group. She ended up in a nightclub called Suju. Uh, she got um, separated from her friends in the early hours of the morning. And just before uh, two o'clock, she left that nightclub. She'd had a few drinks um, and she left to walk home. She probably only lived about half a mile away from the nightclub. Uh, she'd been in contact with her boyfriend throughout the evening um, and her boyfriend was expecting her home. When he woke in the early hours of the, the Saturday morning, she wasn't there. So he's really concerned. Sean's boyfriend, Kevin Reap, contacted the police. Initially, I personally wasn't panicking too much because I did think she's maybe gone back with one of the girls she'd been out with um, and just not, you know, she was still asleep, basically. But by early afternoon, um, then I was concerned that, no, this this isn't Sean. She, you know, she's not long moved in with Kevin and there's no way she would just go to ground like that. Sean did not have a track record of going missing. In fact, she had everything to live for. She just moved in with her partner and she had a good job, an office job, so there was no reason why she would suddenly disappear. She was at a really good juncture in her life. The second eldest of four siblings Sean also had a close bond with her family. We had a good relationship. As she got older, we had sort of mum and daughter days out. I took her to see a couple of shows in London for birthdays. So, yeah, yeah, I'd say we, we, were, we were close, yeah. Sean was always happy, very rarely down, very bubbly right from a young child, never any trouble. Generally always upbeat, happy, and a pleasure to be around, really. A very vibrant person. It was quite obvious from the outset that this was completely out of character. Sean had never been missing before. She came from a loving family, was in a loving relationship. So very, very quickly, it was clear to us, the police, that something really serious had happened to Sean. So an investigation commenced almost immediately. Bristol-based ITV news correspondent Rob Murphy was quick to pick up on Sean's case. The first time I knew anything about this case was when I got an email from Wiltshire Police on a Saturday morning in March 2011. Uh, it said that a young woman, uh, Sean O'Callaghan, had gone missing. Importantly, this email also said that the lead detective in this case was Steve Fulcher, who's a high-ranking police officer. I knew straight away that this was was a big deal because they simply wouldn't have put a detective of this this rank in charge of just a basic missing persons inquiry. If there was to be any chance of finding Sean alive, Wiltshire police, led by Steve Fulcher, had to ensure that their investigation moved as quickly as possible. We were told on the Sunday afternoon that they were wanting to do a press conference on the Monday. The police were very good. They explained to us sort of how it works and Kevin um, wanted to do the appeal. I just want to say how very worried we are about Sean. I said, I think it's important that if you want to do it, that you do do it. 
uh, Ishan's mum, who was there, along with her dad and brothers and sisters. She's been missing now for over two days. And it's not like her not to come home or, or contact any of us for such a long time. It was heartbreaking, actually. Kevin gave a very emotional uh, plea for information. This is a terrible time for all of us, and we're praying for Sean's safe return. After the press conference, the detective told us a bit more about what he knew. He said that during the evening, Sean had had a text exchange with her boyfriend, and those text messages were bouncing off a phone mast in Swindon, where the nightclub was, where she was. Uh, but later on, in the early hours, after she'd left the nightclub, her phone signal was bouncing off another mast, about 10 miles south, uh, in a place called Savanac Forest. And she had no reason to be down in Savanac. And that was particularly worrying. The police had now discovered Shan's last known location, Savanac Forest. But covering an area of 4,500 acres, trying to find traces of Shan would prove to be a very tough task. After a while, you know, it's clear that this was a, it was a sort of needle in a haystack job, just searching for a young woman in this, this vast expanse of, uh, of historic woodland. Sean's disappearance seemed to grip the nation. It covered nationwide. There were several thousand people that turned up to assist in the search in Savanac. There were hundreds of thousands of hits on Facebook and Twitter trying to assist in the investigation. We wanted the public support. We didn't know where Sharm was. We needed to find her, hopefully alive. And tonight, Sharm's friends are making their own searches of the forest roadside, looking for her phone or any trace of her. On the television, you're seeing photos of Sharm coming up, um, hundreds and hundreds of people searching Savanac, and you, you, you almost can't equate the two. It's, you sat there thinking, you're watching the television thinking, this is all, this is for Sean, this is for Sean. Within a few days, police called off the search. It appeared that they had a lead. Kind of got the impression that something was happening behind the scenes. They asked for people to stop coming down to Savanac, uh, to let police do their job. And then we got the message that the police were very confident that they would soon know the uh, whereabouts of Sean and what had happened to her. After tracing Sean's last movements, the police had in fact identified a prime suspect. When Sean went missing, the first thing that happened was uh, trying to trace her last movements. So the CCTV at the nightclub and the surrounding roads were checked. And it was at that point that we could see Sean on the CCTV Unfortunately, as it often happens, she walked away from the camera out of sight, but she was never seen again. But what we did see was a dark coloured car, unfortunately not recognisable, drive slowly away. So straight from the outset, there was a, an inference to suggest that she may well have got into that car. We couldn't read the registration number and there were no suspects or any identification of that, that vehicle. Officers viewed several thousand hours of CCTV. Uh, a one second clip, they saw a police car driving around the town. And in our police cars, we do have a, a system called ANPR, which is automatic number plate recognition. It effectively just reads the number plates of cars coming by and tells us whether they're stolen, no insurance, no MOT, etc. By seeing that car, they went back and looked at the data stored within that car, and they picked up a car coming the other way that looked very similar to the car that may have taken Sean. So a one second clip gave us our first clue and that led us on to uh, someone who became of significant intra interest to us, Christopher Halliwell. Christopher Halliwell um, was someone that was well known and well liked in the community. Um, he was in a position of trust, he was a minicab driver so um, families all over Swindon trusted him to get their daughters, wives, sisters home um, safely. He was a father, he was a, a partner and he seemed like he had a lot of friends. This discovery meant the police had a very difficult decision to make. Do you go and arrest him and maybe not, not get any evidence and not, not uh, either find Sean alive or dead? Or do you place him under surveillance? Uh, the officer in charge of the investigation at that time decided to place him under surveillance 
to see whether he would lead, uh, whether Christopher Halliwell would lead us to Sean, hoping that she'd still be alive. So he was placed under 24-hour surveillance and followed for a, a few days. Uh, some of his activity was normal, but some of it was not. On one particular evening, he drove out to a rural location. Uh, very difficult to follow people there because your cars are seen, so we were some distance behind. But when we caught up with him, we found a small fire and burning there were some seat covers, which had obviously come from his car, which again, to the officers dealing, raised their suspicions that Christopher Halliwell was responsible for what, I, what had happened or, uh, or the outcome of, of what had happened to Sean. Christopher Halliwell was also observed acting suspiciously at a petrol station. Christopher Halliwell went in to buy some sweets and, and um, petrol, and on the counter was the local paper with a picture of Sean O'Callaghan. Now, he placed his sweets on top of that because obviously he knew what he'd done to Sean O'Callaghan. But subsequently, the taxi rank were given a number of posters because obviously taxis are driving around all day. He selected one of those posters and placed in the rear of his taxi, which was, please help us find Sean, do you have any information? Surveillance operations were interrupted on Thursday the 24th of March when police activities took a surprising turn. I think it was late morning on the Thursday, they told us that they had now had to arrest him. Uh, we had a call from sources that there had been an arrest, uh, an arrest at uh, a supermarket in Swindon. The trigger to making them arrest him was when he was spotted purchasing what the police called an overdose quantity of paracetamol. So they were scared that he was going to do something that would make sure that they could never interview him. So they arrested him. Um, and they conducted, first of all, an urgent interview in the back of a police car. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act allows us to conduct an urgent interview in circumstances where we're looking uh, for someone who may have been kidnapped and maybe still be alive, and therefore it's really urgent to find them. This supermarket was besieged by journalists within a couple of hours. It all happened by that stage. They'd arrested this man and taken him away, and another drama was unfolding away from our eyes. Hoping Sean O'Callaghan was still alive, the police prayed that Christopher Halliwell would talk and tell them of her whereabouts. But nothing could have prepared them for the secrets Halliwell was about to reveal on that day. Coming up, Christopher Halliwell breaks his silence. What happened next was you know, utterly remarkable. Fulcher's gamble was working. And the suspect was talking. But would the police be ready for his shock confession? And then he said the line, do you want another one? Twenty-two-year-old Sean O'Callaghan had been missing for five days when taxi driver Christopher Halliwell was arrested in relation to her disappearance. The police hoped that Sean was still alive and that Halliwell would reveal her whereabouts, but what they were about to learn would send shockwaves through the force. When Halliwell was arrested, the, the lead detective, Steve Fulcher, wasn't there. He was very concerned about where was Sean. And he knew the only way of finding out where Sean was was if Halliwell talked. Steve Fulcher took a monumental gamble, a colossal gamble at this point. Steve Fulcher asked the arresting officers to divert Christopher Halliwell's car to Barbary Castle so he could have an interview with him. 
because at the time they thought that maybe Sean could be near Barbary Castle. Normally a suspect is read his rights, taken to a police station, given a lawyer, and everything happens in the police station. But Steve Fulcher thought, well, look, Sean might still be alive. I need to, uh, I need to speak to him directly. This was an unprecedented move by Steve Fulcher, but would his extraordinary actions pay off? Christopher Halliwell was flanked by officers because of, he'd been arrested for a very serious offence. And during that uh, interview, Christopher Halliwell said he would take the officers to where he had dumped the body of Sean O'Callaghan which obviously was the first indication that Sean had been killed. And Christopher Halliwell identified an area where he had taken Sean and rolled her down an embankment and had started to remove some of her clothing. Halliwell directed them to this country lane and said he'd left Sean's body in the open. A search team began its work and found her body that afternoon. He was then told that he'd go to the police station where he'd have his solicitor and all of his rights given to him. What happened next was you know, utterly remarkable. Halliwell was sort of opening up to Steve Fulcher. Fulcher's gamble was working. The suspect was talking. Uh, he, Halliwell was saying that he wasn't right, that he was sick. Normal people don't go around murdering other people. And he said, we need to have a chat to the detective. The detective and the suspect talking man to man. And then Halliwell turned to Fulcher and said, do you want another one? He then went with the officers to a very remote location called East Leach, and he identified an area where he had killed another person. He didn't give the name. He said he didn't know her name. After that, Halliwell was taken back to uh, the police station. He was given a lawyer and he was read his rights again. And his, from that moment on, all he said to the police was, no comment. Shockingly, Christopher Halliwell had revealed the burial spot of a second victim. But until they could exhume the body, the police didn't know who it belonged to. What they did know for sure was that Sean was dead and that they had to tell her family the heartbreaking news. It's those words, we found Sean, she is dead. It's, it's, hear, hearing that was brutal. It was devastating. Because then you've just got to immediately think, um, you're never going to see them again. Straight away, just, you get that news, never going to see them again. I did go up to Suju and see all the things outside the nightclub a few days after she was found, which was a highly emotional moment uh, when we went up there. Um, so I knew how much this had really affected the community and beyond. With Christopher Halliwell in custody, once they'd unearthed a second body, the pressure was now on the police to identify the remains. When someone's in custody, we obviously want to identify who the victim is because we want to ask the suspect some questions. She was only skeletal remains, unfortunately. We took a piece of her bone. We sent it off for urgent analysis. The laboratory processed the DNA overnight, so within 12 hours, we had an interim report. 11 days after Christopher Halliwell's arrest, the full DNA results confirmed police suspicions as to the identity of the second victim. I got that knock on the door. It was Steve Fulcher. I said to him, oh my God. I said, it's my daughter, isn't it? And he said, yes. It takes an awful time for your brain to process something like that because I didn't want to believe it. I was, I 
didn't want to. You know the expression when somebody says to you, I was physically sick. You just think it's an expression. Well, I was physically sick. I couldn't believe it. My beautiful little girl. I was never going to see her again. In the eight years Becky had been missing, this was the news Karen had been dreading the most. There was some small comfort in the fact that the man responsible for murdering her daughter would be punished for his crime. But Karen was to receive a devastating blow. Chris Hallowell got an incredible barrister. And he looked at how Hallowell had been arrested and at this breach of protocol afterwards and said, you can't just be taken out into the middle of the countryside and gently talked to by a police officer. That, that's not right. This, you can't be prosecuted for this. They've, your confession doesn't stand. You know, your confession wasn't given properly. You didn't have any legal representation. He'd murdered her, he'd admitted it. He even took her, he even took the police to the area and paced out steps. There was a dip in the wall where he'd removed a stone. That was Halliwell's marker. He'd murdered her. That was the end of story. So why was Becky's name being dropped? The judge ruled that Steve Fulcher had breached the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984 by failing to caution Halliwell and denying him access to a solicitor. Because his confession had been discounted, there was not enough supporting evidence to proceed with the prosecution for Becky's murder. However, through their surveillance activities, the CCTV footage and forensic evidence, the police had built a strong case against Halliwell in relation to Sean's murder. With Sean's case, there was DNA linking him to Sean. There was DNA linking uh, of his found on Sean's body. Um, and they found uh, some remains of her, some of her DNA in, in his car. The interesting thing for me with Christopher Halliwell is on the night that he killed or abducted and killed Sean, an hour beforehand, he switched off all of his communications. He switched off his phone. He switched off his taxi radio. He was seen cruising around CCTV in the Swindon area. Had he set his mind to abduct and kill someone that night, why else would he still be there but sever all communications and therefore not be traced? I strongly suspect he had killing or raping in his mindset that evening. Sean's family was spared a full trial when prosecuting counsel received confirmation from the defense that Halliwell would be pleading guilty to the murder of Sean O'Callaghan. I do remember getting the phone call to be told that he was just going to change his plea to guilty, and I just immediately broke down when I was told that um, on the phone. Thank goodness we haven't got to go for a trial for Sean. Um, so there was an immense relief when he then changed his plea to guilty because I just knew that the whole family had not got to be put through a trial for Sean. It was confirmed that Sean's death was a result of the combined effects of two stab wounds to the head and neck, along with compression of the neck, for which Christopher Halliwell was sentenced to life with a minimum of 25 years. I can remember many days, day after day, going to sleep at night with tears. What must she have gone through? What must she have gone through? It just in my mind all the time. What must she have suffered? What, how, how, long, how long was she in that car? Did it happen in the car? Did it happen in the, uh, wherever he took her to? You know, how, how long? And you, you just, as a parent, I just kept saying, I just hope it was quick. I just hope it was quick and she didn't know much about it. For Sean's family, there was some solace in the fact that her killer had been punished. But for Becky's loved ones, justice was yet to be done. Unable to use his hillside confession, could the police find new evidence to ensure that Christopher Halliwell would pay for Becky's murder? Coming up, the police make a breakthrough. We were now able to use his admission that he made on that fateful day in 2011. And Karen Edwards comes face to face with Christopher Halliwell. Here stood before me is the man that took my daughter's life. 
It is chilling and terrifying that people like Christopher Hallowell exist. On the 19th of October 2012, Christopher Halliwell was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years behind bars for the murder of Sean O'Callaghan. Whilst he had managed to escape punishment for Becky's murder, what he hadn't counted on was that her family were never going to give up on their crusade for justice. Um, Karen Edwards, she'd already vowed that she would never give up um, she wanted to make sure she got justice for her daughter. She launched um, a petition, and that was called the Justice for Becky Petition. Before I knew it, I'm bombing up and down the country, giving talks early in the morning, late at night, plus doing TV interviews and radio interviews, because I needed to get this out. I needed to get as much publicity as I possibly could. I had, on the 14th of February, I had um, the visit. I'm sure memory. And he said, I have some news for you. We're going to reinvestigate Becky's murder. Wiltshire police were back on the case, but Sean Memory and his team had a difficult task ahead. I almost had to forget that Christopher Halliwell was responsible for the murder. The fact that I couldn't use any of the evidence obtained during the first investigation was almost like investigating with one hand tied behind my back. I had to find new evidence and I couldn't use anything that had been obtained from that original investigation. Amazingly, it wasn't long before the police had a breakthrough. When I conducted a forensic review, I identified that a number of tools from Christopher Halliwell's shed had been seized, but had not been examined. We sent the spades off for analysis, and unbelievably, a microscopic uh, piece of soil had stuck to that spade from 2003 until we had it examined in 2014. That soil was extremely unique and it matched almost identically to the deposition site as to where Becky's body was found. The evidence continued to mount up. I wanted to narrow down exactly when he may have killed her. And we identified that he had RAC membership and he had in fact broken down in the very early hours of the 3rd of January 2003. And unbelievably, he'd broken down near to the deposition site of Becky, having run out of fuel. Quite quickly, we identified that he made an unannounced visit to his doctors that afternoon. And the doctor noted that he'd broken his finger and he had a number of scratches to his face and that he was also in a highly emotional state. Finally, after nearly two years of tireless investigation, the police had enough evidence to prosecute Christopher Halliwell for Becky's murder. It was a very surreal feeling. Halliwell had been arrested. He'd been charged for Becky's murder. Now, was he going to get away with it again? So now the emotions start again, you know? You go through another set of emotions because you've been up this road before. Then the day came. On the 5th of September, 2016, Christopher Halliwell's trial for the murder of Becky Gordon Edwards started at Bristol Crown Court. To actually see him in the flesh again, my stomach churned. And I thought, here stood before me is the man that took my daughter's life, and I hope and pray they find this man guilty with the evidence that they've collated. But Halliwell had decided to make a surprise move. 
he decided to defend himself. Uh, I'm sure he thought he knew best and that uh, he could uh, work the legal system. And it shows, I think, something about Hallowell the man, the man who, uh, very self-obsessed, very confident in his own abilities, a man who got rid of his own legal counsel because he thought they weren't doing a good enough job. He thought he could do um, a better job. Early on, it became clear that Christopher Halliwell had made a big error of judgment in deciding to defend himself. He said in his defence case statement he never knew Becky and that he wasn't responsible for her murder. We then decided to challenge that because we knew from the previous investigation he'd made admissions and taken us to the deposition site and where he'd murdered Becky. We were now able to use his admission that he made on that fateful day in 2011. Further to that, we had interviewed him in 2015 regarding the murder of Becky. I can resolve the matter, but I don't want you coming back every couple of years, every five years, every 10 years, whatever. During that interview, he tried to strike a deal with me. He said, if I promised not to prosecute him for any other matters, particularly sexual matters, then he would uh, clear the matter up today. If he goes to court and I'm found guilty, that's it. They lock me up and swing all the teeth. Clear those matters up clearly meant that he would make admissions and allow the, Be the, the family of Becky and Sean to grieve in peace. We were able to use that interview as well against him. There was an overwhelming case against Halliwell. But for Becky's mum, Karen, the evidence was very tough to hear. You're hearing gruesome details. You're hearing things about your daughter that you didn't know. Things about that she used to stand around on street corners. You find out how bad things were. In the back of your mind, you suspected it. You didn't really want to accept it. You thought that if you didn't think about it, it would go away and it wasn't happening. It is believed before her death, Becky had turned to prostitution to fuel her drug habit, and some acquaintances from this time had come forward. A former street worker who knew Becky very well, that there was this guy called taxi driver Chris, who was bugging her all the time, who would uh, follow her around, who would stay in the park up in the corner where she used to work and, and, and annoy her. Uh, he would hire her and he wouldn't leave her alone. He would drive her about, he would give her money so that she could buy her drugs but not have to work. Uh, and she found him irritating, deeply, deeply irritating. But we hadn't known until this point, until the trial, that, they, that there was a relationship between the murder victim and the killer. This was new to us. Also, a friend of Becky's gave evidence to she'd seen Becky on the night of January the 3rd 2003 uh, they'd been to a nightclub together in Swindon a taxi had approached them she couldn't identify the taxi driver and couldn't describe him but saw Becky having an argument with the taxi driver and Becky then said I've got to go now got in the taxi and was never seen again now was that Christopher Halliwell I strongly believe that could have been him and that was her final fateful journey. The net was closing in on Christopher Halliwell, but could he manage to talk his way out of a conviction for Becky's murder? He was shambolic. He uh, made weak points in the trial. He got confused, he was confusing. He came up with a, a, what the judge later described as a cock and bull story about uh, two drug dealers who he refused to name, uh, being the real killers of Becky, and he was driving them around. Uh, he, he, was, he was utterly unimpressive. Despite this, Christopher Halliwell did administer one final blow in court to Steve Fulcher, who had resigned from his job after being accused of gross misconduct. And this was the first time the two men had seen each other uh, in, in half a decade. Uh, the killer and the detective looked at each other from across courtroom. It was a moment of pure courtroom drama. And as the evidence ended that day, Halliwell said, I've got one more thing to say to you. It was a pleasure ruining your career. I think I gasped. And I just looked at the family, and they were just incredulous. They couldn't believe that he'd said that. And I think that sort of that moment exposed to the entire courtroom 
the kind of person that he was, that he was almost taking pleasure in the power he was exerting over that courtroom. After two weeks, the jury finally retired to consider their verdict. And when the jury come back and said, guilty. Oh my God, I, I was holding my breath, waiting, just waiting for them. Oh, it was such a relief. It is chilling and terrifying that people like Christopher Hallowell exist. Becky's family were in tears and crying and shouting. Hallowell smirked. And as he was led away from the docks, he sort of looked directly at Karen, at Becky's mum, and, and sort of smirked. Christopher Halliwell was finally going to be punished for Becky's murder. So then the day came, the judge came back and said, Mr. Halliwell, I am giving you a whole life sentence. Well, we couldn't believe that, a whole life sentence. You know, he will never face parole. He will never get out of prison. But for, for Becky's uh, mum and dad, it just may, must be such a relief. Two families finally had justice, and this was partly down to the actions of one man. If it had been somebody else that evening that was on that call and not Steve Fulcher, Becky would still be a missing person. She would still be rotting in that field. I wouldn't have been able to have laid her to rest. I've had that privilege to do that. And that was down to Steve Fulcher. But the fact remains that Christopher Halliwell took the lives of two young girls and left a heartbreaking void in their families, which will never be filled. Never closure to my thoughts on what Sean must have gone through and her brothers and sisters not having her, us not having her, and anyone else who knew her, because she was an amazing person, and the void's there forever. It still feels like a very bad dream now, even though I've lived this nightmare for all these years. It still don't feel real. There are only 70 people who have currently been sentenced to a whole life tariff in the UK and it's certainly a fitting punishment for Christopher Halliwell's crimes. Not only did he viciously take the lives of two young women, but he also robbed two families of their daughters. Karen Edwards' remarkable courage in fighting to see Becky's killer pay for his crime will no doubt strike a chord with all mothers and families out there. Mm -hmm.